poisonous. because I think that was a big mistake of things like kin and these social networking phones that were suggested in the past. The lack of choice in your hardware is one of the big decisions on any mobile phone, as well as the operating system that runs it. Um, and I think one of the Android's successes has been the fact not only is it a great platform to run a smartphone, but it's also available on a multitude of different uh, types of smartphone. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's just my opinion, but uh, I certainly hope this that... This uh, get quite a few companies to work on improving it and competing on it and trying to get the best hardware available. Uh, what was, that's one of the problems I think the iPhone is having is that some people say, oh, it's not fragmented, you only have one type of iPhone, you know, the screen size, but at the same time, you have one single company organizing and coordinating all the usage of the, you know, of the components and everything, and when they get things wrong, like with the Wi-Fi doesn't work on the iPhone uh, uh, 3 so well, sorry, the iPad 3 again, or when there is no good reception on the iPhone 4, uh, there is no way around it. That's the only way you can get iOS on a phone. And it's faulty in some ways because there is no competition, there is no diversity to compensate for it. In, in one respect, I am actually in favour um, somewhat of, um, of, I don't want to say no diversity in hardware, um, a standardisation of hardware because being brought up or having some of my best computer days on the Amiga computer, it does, when it works, work very well to have one platform one one machine, one set of specs that everybody's using, which really is foolproof in terms of uh, when you're speaking about development. Um, that is a major, major advantage. The drawback is, as you've said and as we've seen um, in the past, there has been issues um, and it takes away the consumer choice at the end of the day because not everybody wants the same shape smartphone. They might want a larger, smaller screen. They might not want all the features. Yeah. So yeah. it's a double-edged sword, really. You, you can't win. I mean, like I say, my my experience or my opinion comes from my experience of my use of the Amiga computer mm. and the spectrum and all that. So uh, I tend to be a little bit tainted um, in respect of standardization, which I think can work, but certainly in the case of Android, it hasn't needed to work because we've got a multitude of phones available to the consumer, all of which that I've used have been very, very good. So uh, mm. there you are. Um, there is one main line. I, mean, I suppose you still have variety in terms of processors and screen sizes. I don't think that's a major issue if you consider the trade, you, you, okay, the trade-offs, you could just make everything the same, but then you would impede, you know, if a company makes a screen for a phone that's, you know, let's say it's across, it gets, it's got like 1280 pixels, and you say, oh, you cannot do that, that's too much, that then you kind of cripple the devices themselves. Actually, I find it quite ironic, I think that the, I think Apple's, one of the old slogans used to be, think different. Now, if you look at all the people with the Apple devices, they all use exactly, exactly the same device. This is not exactly individuality. As soon as the company actually grows big, and loads of people have iPods and pretty much the same, it's not exactly a matter of you know being different. It's just a matter of being the same as everybody else buys from Apple. And with Android, I mean, you've got, I think, like, I don't know, over 100 tablets now. You've got, like, 200 phones, I imagine, different models of phones. Uh, and there you can actually choose things. You can actually say that's my type of phone, and you can actually work with your, um, you can actually work with a community of people actually using the phone, and you can speak to the company in a different way than having to approach the same shop. But I, I, I don't, I, I, I suppose some people don't mind when they have very uniform things. But if, can you imagine if the same thing was applied to cars? Yeah, it's. I mean, it, it is very much a double-edged sword, and I can see, um, in this instance, the uh, argument for standardisation. Um, if I may, just jump back to the Amiga and just give a very quick example of why it was such a good thing. When you look at phones, uh, the, especially smartphones, and you've got some rather advanced uh, games and uh, software coming out of these phones, I've seen a couple myself from some of my colleagues at work, and uh, they're running pretty advanced games that you'd expect to see on a console or on a big TV. Um, Max Payne's coming to Android now. Well, I, I saw, um, I think, I'm sure I saw Dead Space. Um, I'm sure that was the, the time I was watching when somebody was checking on with it at work. But uh, it, it was rather impressive, and I, it did look up, nearly up to the standard from the quick glance I got of the current spec, uh, the current generation console. So I was actually very impressed. But the problem is this. Uh, not everybody's running the same hardware. And if you're coding a game like that for uh, a smartphone with uh, Processor X, it's you're invariably going to get somebody who doesn't have Processor X, and maybe theirs isn't quite up to the same speed, 
and you get somebody who's disappointed in the in the title because the developers are specifically writing it as best they can for the most powerful processor out there to handle the graphic, you know, the fancy uh, the fancy code. On the Amiga, you knew that the developers had to develop it for the Amiga 500. Um, there was nobody with uh, another graphics card shoved in, or if there were, there was, it was for commercial use. And everybody had the same hardware. We all had one meg of RAM. Oh, and please let me have that one, anybody who's a Mega fan. I know there was 500, uh, 500, uh, K, and then it became standard for one meg. But we, we mostly had one meg of RAM. So the developers could only develop for that particular spec. So you knew when you're playing the game, your experience was the best experience that the developers could do. And it was, there was some very, very good trickery involved by the developers in order to get these titles to the Amiga 500 to make it work on, on the machine at a reasonable pace so that people would want to buy it. What worries me is that as the specs get larger and larger and larger, the development side of things gets lazier and lazier. You look on the PC, and some of the games that are needing now, you go into the shops, and the specs you require are, are on the level of Skynet. Your PC needs to be some super-powered supercomputer that's virtually self-aware in order just to play the most recent game on a half-decent graphics setting at a reasonable frame rate. Uh, and that's that's what concerns me. So it's the standardization in that respect does have a have a bonus. Again, with the flaws of any software, you know, sometimes we've seen this on every every smartphone. Yet there will be a, a a couple of bugs or errors that will crop up on one particular phone that don't happen on another. And the reason well, we sometimes find out, we sometimes don't. Whereas when you've got standardization, a bug can pr- pr- pretty quickly be squashed if it's uh, if everybody's using the same hardware because people aren't going to buy the product. And that's probably the biggest driver for the uh, developers to develop a, uh, get rid of the bug. So that, that, that's my little rant uh, for standardization. I probably haven't put it across very eloquently, but uh, at the moment I'm sitting in a very dark room. Are you, you in favor of doing the same thing on a desktop, though? No. Uh, I, I'd no, like the best of both worlds. Open question, yeah. yeah. I, I would like the best of both worlds. Um, I can actually argue the case for both sides of, 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 of the argument. For both the standardization of hardware and the non standardization of hardware. Yeah. The other side of the coin, which I've mentioned earlier, would be I would say, no, we shouldn't have standardization of hardware because we want There is something it. like that. It's the consoles now, yeah. uh, single purpose thing, yeah, DRM exactly. everywhere. So. so, I mean, and, and that's a great solution because you've got the console for the gaming needs and then you've got your your desktop PC and your, um, your tablets, etc., for your hobbyist, your computer user, your mainstream consumer. All those type of people, and that's great, and that works very well. Um, so I, I can argue the case for both sides, it, and it's never clear cut. It's a shade of grey instead of black or white, I think, uh, in my opinion. But uh, I would like to put that across more eloquently, but I hadn't planned on answering that question, so I apologise, and I probably insulted a lot of people, um, especially Amiga users with 500k in memory. Um, uh, moving on to the next topic, which yeah. is sort of linked to this now, um, and this is, I think, unless you have any other little ones to put in at the end. It's going to be the talking points for the end of the show this week. Mm-hmm. And this was an article from Datamation, and it's proprietary software for Linux, a good idea. Again, this is one of the subjects I fall either side of. So, because I've ranted for the last few minutes all to myself, I'd like you to start this one, Roy. Um, I haven't, I've seen the article, I haven't actually read it because I don't quite like the writer, but uh, the, uh, the first thing that came to my mind is, why ask if it's okay for Linux? You can ask it about any platform. Uh, you can ask whether a proprietary piece of software is good on any platform at all. Now, the argument might be that if Linux is open source, you might want to run something open source on top of it to keep things kind of pure, to keep things such that you can kind of track things all the way down to the hardware and check where the bugs are, or check where the restriction is and remove the restriction if there is a restriction you don't like. Uh, for example, if you code uh, something for military uses and you don't really want things to be remotely disabled. Uh, now, when it comes to proprietary software, I, I use some proprietary software sometimes in Linux, and uh, I, uh, I prefer not to use proprietary software, but sometimes I have to use proprietary software, and, and that's not something I uh, feel too strongly about, as you uh, probably know. What gets me about this article, I don't know a lot about the writer, so I, I can't really uh, comment on that. I've read, briefly skimmed over the the whole article, because we know what it's going to be about, and we know the question has been asked. But what does puzzle me, and I see this quite a lot, is that when somebody's a Windows user, are they only allowed to use proprietary software and not allowed to use any uh, free and open source software? Because there is free, free and open source software for the Windows platform. So asking the question of 
is it a good idea for Linux users to run proprietary software? It's the same as asking, is it a good idea for Windows users to run POS? Yeah. Um, exactly the same thing. It comes down to a combination of choice and using the best tool. There are drawbacks to using proprietary. We've explained them and explored them before. There's drawbacks to using open source software for some people, um, and we've explored those before.